Embassy. Uh, we are glad to welcome you for this new uh, digital diplomacy series event. And I am uh, glad to invite to the podium uh, uh, the Italian ambassador, His Excellency Claudio Bisognero. Please. Is taking a picture to tweet. <laughs> yeah. Not time enough. Well, thank you so much. Welcome to the Embassy, Benvenuti, and welcome to our digital diplomacy series. Uh, we've been nurturing this conversation on the role of technology and innovation on foreign policy for quite some time, as you know, many of you know, since actually 2012. That's when we began with our series here at the Italian Embassy, and I know that many of you have been part of this path and many, I hope, will join us in uh, the future. Today, we welcome uh, Moises Naim. He will guide us through the changing notion of power in the digital age, a truly historic uh, transformation in the way we conduct our business, in the way society and the world uh, act uh, in, uh, in international affairs. So much so that a few months ago, one of the biggest uh, players in the digital age, Mark Zuckerberg, obviously the founder of Facebook, chose uh, Dr. Naim's latest book, The End of Power, as his first pick to inaugurate his Year of Books uh, uh, challenge. And by the way, this is uh, The End of Power in Italian, La Fine del Potere. This is the Italian translation. The book has been translated in uh, 22 languages, I understand. And I would like to thank you for my own personal uh, copy, once again, in uh, Italian. The End of Power is a book that is having a big impact on uh, all of us. Uh, former President Bill Clinton said, and I quote him, it will change the way you read the news, the way you think about politics, and the way you look at the world. And Arianna Huffington said, and I quote, it is a compelling and original perspective on the surprising new ways power is acquired, used, and lost, and how these changes affect our daily uh, lives. That's the end of quote from Arianna. Not many, however, are aware that uh, Dr. Naim knows Italy uh, quite well and speaks uh, fluent uh, Italian uh, by uh, the way. He has collaborated with many Italian newspapers and Italian talents, and most recently he has collaborated with researcher uh, Andrea Stroppa, who is part of the team of the Italian Prime Minister. He's part of uh, Prime Minister Matteo Renzi's Digital Champions Project and a columnist with the Huffington Post. So, grazie uh, per essere con noi oggi. Thank you for being with us uh, today. And uh, another Italian speaker I just learned is with us today because I would also like to thank um, Ali Weinberg of ABC News, who agreed to moderate uh, our event today, who I just learned, as I said, is also an Italian speaker. And we all know that before joining ABC, where she's focusing on foreign policy, on national security issues. Uh, Ali Weinberg was at NBC where she covered the presidential elections and the White House. So Dr. Naim, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you have the floor and thank you for your attention. Thank you, grazie uh, ambasciatore, and thank you all uh, for making the time uh, being here. One of the great things of talking about power in Washington is that there is no need to say much. Uh, uh, people understand uh, what it is, what we're talking about. And so what I, I will do is I, I'll be very brief and just provoke you with a few assertions and comments and then have a, a conversation uh, and then and, and exchange with all of you. So uh, let me start. I think the best thing, to, the, the, the notion that there's something going on with power in the 21st century worldwide, I think it's easy to accept. I think I don't need to dwell on that. Uh, you all know that there, is, there are shifts, there are new players, there are new surprises, there there's a lot going on. But what I argue in the book is that there is more than a shifting power and more than new protagonists. Uh, what I argue is that there is a fundamental change, not in the definition of power, but in the way power is acquired, uh, used, and lost. And I then uh, define that as a decay of power. 
I think power is decay. And by that I mean that, yes, power may be shifting from A to B, but what B can do with that power is more constrained and limited than what A uh, could do with it. I also uh, always like to clarify that I don't uh, mean that there are that huge power centers uh, no longer exist. Uh, from Facebook to Google and JP Morgan to uh, the Pentagon to the Vatican to Xi Jinping and the government of China and, and, and Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama and the Exxon Mobil and uh, uh, you know you can go on the list. Uh, uh, these are very important centers of power and uh, they shape things. What I argue instead is that these centers of concentrated huge power are more constrained in the range of options that they used to have are now narrower. So let me start with a few uh, examples. So let me start with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, two weeks ago, and these are all, I deliberately picked uh, examples that are very recent. They are in the news this week or last week. Uh, and I, um, I was very deliberate in picking examples from a wide variety uh, of uh, human undertakings and uh, geographies. And I wanted to start, as I said, with the Berlin Philharmonic. Two weeks ago, the 123 musicians of the Berlin Philharmonic that went to a secret location, uh, gave, handed uh, their cell phones and tablets, and met to vote uh, uh, to pick their, uh, the new conductor. The Berlin Philharmonic, as you know, is uh, thought to be one of the best philharmonic orchestras in the world. And that's how they have been picking uh, the, the conductor since 1882. And you know, Herbert von Karajan and Claudio Abbado and, and others have been uh, the conductors. Well, this time, for the first time since 1882, they couldn't agree. So they uh, took a page from the US Congress and decided to kick the can. And their decision was to meet again next year to see if they can agree on who should be the next conductor of the Philharmonic Orchestra. At the same time that these news were breaking, uh, something was happening in the world of soccer. And that I'm, of course, referring to the scandal with FIFA and Sepp Blatter and everything you have seen. Uh, again, this is an organization that even a few years ago would have themed uh, untouchable, right? FIFA, you know, we all knew, and there were constant uh, reports about corruptions and dysfunction and, and all kinds of opaque, money-centered uh, deals, uh, but no one had touched it. And Mr. Blatter seemed to be an untouchable head of state, and he was treated by heads of state as, as, one of, as a peer, he would visit and offer. Uh, uh, possibilities and, and, and deals in, in marketing and, and things like that. Well, you know, you all know he was reelected, and uh, after in his election, he, he said, you know, I know that FIFA has problems, uh, FIFA, uh, but FIFA doesn't need a revolution. FIFA needs evolution, and I am going to fix FIFA. Well, no, uh, FIFA was is going to be fixed if at all by American prosecutors that are going to send to jail a bunch of FIFA leaders uh, in, 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 in the next uh, in, in the days ahead. Um, and then four years, four days later, he resigned. So from the Philharmonic, uh, the Berlin Philharmonic to the world of soccer, to the world of politics. In recent weeks, we have uh, had now a month uh, elections in the United Kingdom, in Spain, where regional elections, uh, in Poland, presidency of uh, the country, uh, Mexico this weekend, uh, very important regional local uh, um, elections, Turkey. Uh, in each one of these elections, the political map of the country was appended in very significant way. And by whom? By a player that did not exist uh, uh, or was not significant even a few months ago. Another example is Netflix. Recently, uh, I think it was one, uh, a very top uh, television executive uh, essentially recognized that Netflix had completely transformed the world of television. 
Uh, and, and you know exactly what it means. It means that in, in the past, the main power centers, the main players in the world of televisions were people that had a, a job uh, titled programmers. They were the people that sat in front of a grid that had days, seven days and hours of the day. And they decided what you would watch at a given day, at a given hour. And these were very powerful people. Uh, and then now uh, the power is less because now you and I and, and, and a lot of people increasingly, you're not watching uh, a channel. You're not watching television at a given time at a given channel. You watch whatever you want, probably in your mobile uh, gadget, uh, wherever you want. So you, the power of the, of the programmer to decide what was going to be watched at what time has now shifted to you. And you know exactly what I mean, and it has to do with streaming. At any given time in the United States, a third of the traffic of internet is streaming, either music or videos. That's a lot of traffic. And that means an important uh, uh, shift. Another recent, uh, last week's news that I thought was very, re reveals quite a bit is that fortune put out his list its list its very famous list of the largest companies in the united states a famous fortune 500. um this is the 61st edition of the fortune uh, 500 and uh, what was very interesting is that 57 percent of the companies in that list today were not in the list 10 years ago so the level of turnover uh, of uh, companies uh, that are the largest in the country is increasing. As is increasing the level of turnover of CEOs. It may not seem that way given uh, all we know about CEO compensation and everything else, but uh, job safety uh, as a CEO is not going up, it's going down. It's very risky these days to be a CEO. You get fired more often than ever. And the statistics bear that out. The, the, the number of uh, the CEOs of uh, the 2,500 largest companies in the world has doubled in the last uh, in the last decade. The other very interesting turnover is with the wealthy. We all know about the one percent and the 99 percent, and we know that the one percent and the zero point one percent of the top of the wealthiest people in the world are concentrating more wealth than ever. That, that's a fact. Inequality in the United States and, uh, and, and England and other places is increasing. Uh, what is very interesting, however, is that if you look at the list in 1982, uh, you would discover that 82% of the people in that list are no longer in the list. Uh, and so that's very interesting in terms of turnover. But another factoid that is even more interesting is that those wealthy people that were in the list in 1982 would have invested their money and obtained just 4% return per year. They would still be in the list of the wealthiest people in the world. So the wealthiest people in the world were not able to sustain uh, a, a, a growth in their, in their net worth that would allow them to stay in the list. And they were replaced. By whom? By Asians. What else? Well, a lot of the, uh, the people that used to be in the list were, had inherited wealth. Who is in the list now? Self-made people. People that invented companies, people that, uh, people that were not wealthy before, that they did not come, they did not inherit their wealth. And there is a lot of churn in that uh, uh, area, too. Another example that I think is worth mentioning, and uh, it's just it's enough in the news to just say it, is ISIS. If we would have had this conversation two or three years ago, I would not have mentioned ISIS. It was not in my radar screen, probably was not in your radar screen. Uh, but ISIS has deeply transformed uh, the security of the Middle East at least the, the swath of land between Syria and, and Iraq, and it has changed all, all you know uh, that is going on with ISIS. Now, will ISIS defeat the Pentagon and the coalition of countries uh, that are fighting it? Probably not, probably not. But is ISIS uh, denying options to this very mighty, powerful wealth 
funded high technology armed forces? Yes. So this group of strange uh, individuals that are not, you cannot argue that ISIS has the best weapons in the world. You cannot argue that ISIS has the best training, uh, military training in the world. You cannot argue that ISIS has the best logistics and financing in the world. Uh, they have a lot of it, but not, not, it's, it's not comparable to uh, the level of funding, technology, training uh, of, of the armed forces that they're fighting. And yet they are denying uh, these armed forces some of the largest in the world options that they had in the past. So, and I can go on. And the story in the book is one of micro powers, new, agile, that play with a different uh, uh, playbook, that have a different script, that use different strategies, uh, are uh, either dislodging from power, uh, the, what I call the mega players or if not taking away all of their power, they're limiting and constraining what they can do with that power. So this is a story of micro players uh, fighting and sometimes succeeding and defeating um, the traditional mega players, micro powers, mega players. Um, why is this happening? There's a long list of reasons. Uh, the digital uh, world is one, but not the most important one in my judgment. Um, the, digital world, uh, technology and uh, social media, inter the internet, are tools. They're instruments. So I am not interested in the instruments. I am interested in the users. Tools need users. So what interests me and what I discuss and, and try to understand in the book is what are the motivations, what are the drivers, expectations, behaviors of these users? Why is it that people that are, have now been empowered by social media and Facebook and Google and, and YouTube and everything else you, we know, why is it that these newly empowered people are behaving in a certain way and not in another? I think, again, I would be foolish to deny the importance of the digital world and social media. All I'm saying is let's not lose sight of the fact that these are tools and that the, it's, it, what is interesting is not to center and understand the tools is understanding instead the users of, of the tools and how and why they're using it in a certain way. So if it is not the internet, what, what is it that, that is driving this? What, uh, and this, I, I'll finish with this, uh, the, the central theme of the book is that in order to have power, you have to have a unique shield and a barrier uh, that protects you from uh, the challenges of your rivals and the pushback of the objects of your power. If you're powerful, you exert power over an individual, a group of individuals, or a group of institutions. Uh, and, uh, and, and you have something that allows you to do that. And there are others that want that. They others that want your power, and they are constantly challenging you. And at the same time, the objects over whom uh, you exert power push back. No, no one wants to be ordered what to do or, or dictated what to do. So the shields that give this power to the mega players uh, or whoever has the power are now becoming less protective. They are uh, more fragile and they are easier to overwhelm, to circumvent and to undermine. And why is because there is a long list of factors uh, that include but transcend the digital technologies that uh, make that so. And I group that long list of factors in what I call the three revolutions, that I call them the more revolutions, the mobility revolution, and the mentality revolution. The more revolution is simply my way of aggregating in one basket the fact that we, we, we live in a world of profusion. Start with the fact that we have more people, but we also have more countries, more currencies, more computers, more medicines, more criminals, more philanthropies, more churches, more pick any activity, any thing that has any relation uh, with the human experience and look at the numbers of what that was 20, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, and see the numbers now. And they have all skyrocketed. There is more of everything. And, uh, and this overwhelms the powerful. It's easier to, Vignia uh, Brzezinski has written that it's easy these days, nowadays, it's easier to uh, kill 100 million people than to govern 100 million people. Uh, and so, you know, the profusion of, of players, the profusion of possibilities uh, 
has consequences of power. And then there is the mobility revolution. It's not just that there is more of everything, it's that the more of everything that we have moves more. Everything moves. Ideologies and, and, and criminal networks and political parties and religions and activists and, 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 and international um, movements and, uh, and, and of course money and people, everything moves more. And power needs a captive audience. If you have power, you need the subjects of your power within a perimeter. And that perimeter is shifting and it's becoming more porous and people are moving more. So it's harder uh, to exert power uh, if you don't have a captive audience, if your audience can move more. Because that also means that new challenges from uh, unpredictable, improbable places are coming. They're not, not just coming from your traditional scope of action, they're coming from places that you cannot even imagine. And the third uh, uh, revolution, so the, the, the mobility revolution allows challengers to bypass uh, the, the, the shields that uh, give power to the powerful. And finally, the mentality revolution uh, is uh, if there is a very profound global change, universal uh, in attitudes, aspirations, it's what I call the mentality revolution. Uh, very different world in terms of what, what people are willing to put up with, what people are intolerating more, what people are want, what people aspire, what people know, what people want, what they believe, and so on. The University of Michigan has been publishing now for almost 50 years the World Values Survey. They go out and they have been going out now for decades and surveying uh, what they claim is a, a, a sample of 85% of humanity. And the questions are always the same. What do you believe? What do you like? What do you expect? What do you aspire? And if you look at the answers uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, and today, it's like they were serving two different planets. Is that humanity has drastically changed in their answers. And that, of course, uh, makes uh, power difficult to, more difficult to exert. The old line, you know, you're going to do that because I say so, is losing potency everywhere from nation states to the dinner table with your uh, teenage kids. Uh, and, and the other phrase, you know, you're going to do this because that's the way it has always been done, is also losing potency. Uh, and so the mentality revolution is undermining uh, the barriers uh, that protect and shield the powerful. The mentality revolutions allow them uh, to circumvent it, and the more revolutions overwhelm those barriers put them all together, shake them, and you end up with a world where power is easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. Thank you. Talking about shaking, that sounds like a delicious, more mobility mentality cocktail. That sounds very tasty. I want to thank everybody for coming out here today. I also want to thank our audiences that are watching live on YouTube and Google+. I want to remind everybody here, as this is digital diplomacy, feel free to use your tools of digital diplomacy. Uh, feel free to be tweeting, uh, posting. The password here, if you're not already online, uh, the Wi-Fi password is Digital Italy, one word, all lowercase. Uh, and of course, as you can see, you can tweet at us while the discussion is going on. Uh, and please use the hashtag digital diplomacy. Uh, and so with that, um, as uh, the ambassador mentioned, I'm going to start the conversation with a couple questions to Moises, and then we're, we'll open it up to questions very, very briefly, uh, very quickly. So Moises, I want to ask you first about uh, the topic that you just raised, and, and also it it's pervades throughout your book, which is the traditional holders of power losing ground to the more innovative, nimble, non-governmental disruptors, uh, including NGOs, charities, things like that. And at the same time as that this is happening, it seems that at least in the United States, fewer and fewer young people are looking at running for office and becoming involved in official government as a means to make a difference in the world. Uh, a recent study by two American professors found that only 13% of the respondents said that they'd want to be members of Congress versus 37% who said they'd rather be a business executive to make a difference. So what happens if the best minds of, of this and future generations don't see government, and I'm not talking about politics, but I'm talking about governance, official channels as a means for good? What a great question. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, the core of one of our challenges uh, today. Uh, it's at the core of... Um, threats to democracy, 
And it's a, it essentially is the manifest is a concrete manifestation of a trend that started in the 90s after the fall of this Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union. Uh, political parties have had a terrible run since 1990 to today because in the past political parties could just become part of the clash of ideologies. But once those clash of ideologies, communism and capitalism and all that, the, the variants, became less of a differentiating trait between political parties, uh, they essentially began to lose uh, uh, centrality for a variety of reasons. But central message is a terrible run for political parties in the last few decades and a wonderful run for NGOs. Non-governmental organizations, movements, activists of all kinds became the natural home for idealists and not the political parties. So political parties are perceived to be the place where opportunists go. And NGOs and movements are the place, is the natural home for where idealists go. So if you are a young or if you're a person that wants to change the world, you would not think of joining a political party. You would join an NGO. Uh, and that's excellent because NGOs are great, but it's also terrible because you cannot have democracies without political parties. And then you end up with the kind of uh, outcomes and statistics that you mentioned. So, um, and there are very good reasons why young people uh, and others, uh, other idealists, uh, are not interested in, um, uh, in joining political parties. They are seen as corrupt, slow moving, oligarchic, exclusionary, uh, not the old, non digital. Uh, and instead, uh, movements and NGOs are, you know, at where the action is, where the young people are, where the idealists that are there for doing good is what they, they are. And I think it's urgent uh, that political parties start to learn uh, from NGOs about how to attract and retain the idealists. It is very important for democracy that political parties become once again the natural habitat for idealists. And uh, that is, uh, and, and, and you mentioned the United States and you're right, but this, uh, this is a universal trend. Political parties uh, in terms of their allure and attractiveness uh, to people that uh, are not in just because they're interested in a career in government or in power or in self-promotion or in opportunism. Um, I, I, that's a problem everywhere. And so it, it is um, a challenge. It's a global challenge to bring back idealists to political parties. And how do you suggest that we address this challenge? I mean, in, in at least American Congress, you have folks like uh, Chuck Grassley, who has developed this persona as this very freewheeling person on Twitter. That's, that is one, only one specific tool, but there are individuals who have tried to use these methods to at least seem like they're as part of the 21st century. But how do you suggest uh, political parties make that leap and become, again, alluring to the next generation of, of young idealists? What is very surprising is uh, how politicians and political parties everywhere uh, talk the talk about digital and everything else, but behave in a, and, and use it in a way that is transparently fake. Uh, one of the great things about the new digital media is that uh, they are in many ways very revealing. You know which politician that has a Twitter feed actually doesn't know even how to use it. Mm -hmm. And it has a bunch of kids uh, and interns that are, that are feeding the... You know who has uh, Facebook pages that are fake. Fake in the sense that, you know, they look like his picture or her picture, but it's... it's so, uh, I, I, I don't know how we change that. I, what I do know is, and what I argue in the last chapter of the book, is that we, humanity is at the verge of a massive wave of innovation in the way in which we govern ourselves. Uh, which exact forms and where and how and at what pace uh, this will happen, I don't know. But I am convinced that we, in the next few decades, we're going to see profound transformations in the way we pick our leaders, uh, hold them accountable, monitor them, and in the way we all participate in politics and collective decision making. 
And another dynamic that you talk about in the book again, uh, and that I'm seeing as a member of the media and as a member of these sort of big three TV networks, uh, it, we're all becoming grow, growing, con uh, increasingly concerned that government's ability to reach constituents without having to use the media as an intermediary. You see uh, Hillary Clinton announcing her presidential bid by posting a YouTube video. Scott Walker visits Israel and then writes about it on Medium uh, in, uh, instead of uh, sitting down and, and doing an interview. So at least for the media, the concern uh, is that we're not going to be able to hold these representatives of big power accountable if they are able to circumvent those channels and access directly constituents. So there seems to be a bit of a, while it's a benefit for them to be able to interact directly, maybe that leads to better democracy, but in a way it also doesn't lead to better democracy. I'm just wondering how you see this balance going between the media's desire for transparency and government's desire for direct access to citizens. So I am more worried about what's happening uh, with the use of digital media and uh, and in general, the relationship with the media in governments that are not democracies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about that, but that's is a bigger concern of mine and, and their attempt to export their ways uh, and methods uh, around the world uh, by using digital means. Concerning the media in places like the United States and democracies in the role, of course, medias, uh, all, all kinds of medias and platforms are finding their way into how to deal with a highly fragmented uh, audience, that it's uh, consumer behavior in, in, in the way we use and consume information is changing at a, an incredible pace. And, and you, 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 you see it every day in your job. Uh, what I, the answer that I have is that that's not a problem of politicians, that's a problem of the media. So we all need, we are, we are all, always, all of you and I are always looking for a Sherpa to help us and guide us in this world of overwhelming, uh, we have a tsunami of uh, information and data and articles and opinions coming to us all the time. So what do we do? We take, we need somebody that holds our hand and points us, points us to where to look and what to, what is credible and what is just fake news. And that can be an individual, a columnist or a reporter that you, that it has credibility, or it can be a brand, you know, you go to The Economist, you go to Bloomberg, you go, you know, places that help you navigate that. And, uh, and they have now, these places uh, uh, have to compete with uh, uh, politicians and government officials that decide to have their own platform. Well, but you can still do a lot for me. I, if Scott Walker goes to Israel and gives a speech, uh, let him use his own platform uh, uh, to do that. What I want from you is not to regurgitate what he said. I want you to tell me how to think about that. I want you to tell me what's the backstory on, on that uh, uh, speech. I want you to tell me what is happening that he's not telling me. So there is a role for people like you and, and, and media uh, to help me understand what uh, the, those that are manipulating or using uh, digital media are not telling me. Sure. So investigative journalism, journalism that adds value not because it repeats what everybody knows, but because it helps me understand, it helps me how to think about this is the way ahead. Yeah, there will always be an appetite for what you're talking about. Uh, and let's get back to the more non-democratic societies that you're talking about. Uh, I want you to touch on uh, the dynamics you're talking about where there might be uh, regimes that try to still control the media. Uh, but also, it seems that these new nations, in terms of digital diplomacy, uh, a lot of authoritarian governments are using these tools for, for evil, for, uh, for they're corrupting these new avenues of, of power. Uh, Russia, the troll farms, people are creating these fake Twitter names uh, to spread disinformation. You see China with this cyber army. Uh, and I, I'm just curious about, you know, what can we do to, is there a way to prevent this from metastasizing even further than it has? Uh, is that up to societies? Is that up to the governments? Uh, where do you stand on that? I am very troubled by all that's going on and uh, in a variety of ways. And I, I don't have, I'm confused. I, I don't know exactly how to think about certain things. Um, I am desperate 
to finally have uh, some whistleblowers from Russia, China, and Iran. Well, I really hope that we get an Assange-like person in China. I really hope that we get uh, um, whistleblowers uh, that reveal the methods uh, of the Russian, uh, you call it digital diplomacy, but it's not really diplomacy, it's beyond that. I want to know how the Iranians uh, manage uh, the, the, the digital world in order to identify, the Iranian secret services uh, use the digital world uh, to identify the nodes and the leaders of whatever opposition happens. So there is a, a the, 9-11 made a household concept, the notion of a symmetric war, right? Everybody, you know, before that, who knew what a symmetric war was? After 9-11, we all immediately understand what is a symmetric war, right? Well, now we have a cyber, uh, a, a cyber asymmetry in, in the way in which uh, uh, these authoritarian governments are using uh, the tools of uh, the digital tools. Uh, and democracies are more at, uh, at, at, at and, and democracies. I, I welcome debates uh, about privacy, the debates about constraining uh, spy agencies uh, to snoop on, on me. But I have, I, I may be naive, uh, but I am more scared of uh, the Chinese hackers or the Russian sponsored hackers than I am of the NSA. You know, I, if the NSA wants to hear on my uh, uh, communications or, or read my emails, I don't like that. I hate that. But I somehow I feel that there is. Uh, there are constraints, uh, and eventually we will know, and there are ways. I feel completely um, lost and uh, vulnerable, and uh, no one is defending me from uh, the attacks from Chinese hackers or the Russian uh, uh, hackers and all that. So that's the kind of asymmetry. Um, I mean, no way I'm saying that I want uh, a, a big brother to become, uh, you know, the United States government to have free reign on how much it can spy on me. But I have to say that I feel safer. Uh, I know how to defend myself. I have the checks and balance and methods and possibilities and realities that it's offered by a democracy. I have media and people like you that are going to be on the lookout for excesses and abuses of governments. But who's defending all of us? from the attacks of Chinese hackers, of trolls factories, or, or, or the Russians. Who is doing that? Yeah. And so, and, and, and note how the conversation, you know, how many uh, hours have we spent on, on, on Assange and Anonymous and, uh, and everything else, and, and how much have, are we discussing this other thing? Uh, Moises, we have a great question from a Twitter user who is watching, at Grant Charlotte one thank you for your question. And the question is, do you have examples of institutions that exert disproportionate digital power compared to their real power? Absolutely. I, 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 yes. Uh, and what would they be? Well, I, I do believe that WikiLeaks is a good example. WikiLeaks has shown that it can wield enormous power. It has uh, you know, had a huge impact on, uh, uh, on diplomacy uh, and so on. Uh, Edward Snowden, it's an amazing example. This is the power of one, uh, a one individual that decided to, uh, uh, you know, some people think of him as a traitor, other people think of him as a, as a patriot, as a hero that created and steered a very necessary debate. But the fact of the matter is that this one individual had immense power and used it. And, uh, but is that an example of where the, the, the digital power that they have is, is, that seems like a place where that's real power as well. That is a place where they're, they're making a difference in terms of uh, the actual conversation going on. Are there places where you see maybe a saber rattling sort of dynamic in terms of the digital space? It doesn't really translate to outside of that power. And well, that's the difference between potential and actual power, right? And that's always very, very hard to assess because how do you measure it? Of course. Uh, I have one more question before we turn it over to uh, the audience's question, but I, I, I want to kind of bring it out to a thousand feet and ask, do you think the circumstances that you describe in your book about the decay of traditional avenues of power, is, is that a permanent dynamic? Do you think the pendulum is going to swing in the other way, and, and where do you see that going? 
I do believe it's a deeply rooted permanent uh, trend uh, that will have uh, it will have uh, ebbs and, and, and valleys, you know, peaks and valleys. Uh, but if you think about the drivers uh, that I discussed, um, you know, the three revolutions. Think about what is inside the three revolution. What is it? What are the variables? Well, a lot of them are quite permanent. Demography. The, the, the international distribution of uh, wealth, the um, the techno you know the spread of technology, the access of technology to uh, to individuals, uh, you know, very often people say that, you know the internet can all, also uh, be equated, for example, to the appearance of, of the telegraph. The difference, of course, is that the telegraph uh, was essentially used by institutions in very concrete geographies. Uh, the internet and social media are being are universal, are used by everyone, are used is an individual tool, uh, whereas the telegraph was. So that tells you a little bit about how deeply, uh, uh, and how widespread and, and deeply entrenched is this. I believe that a lot of what I described in the book is universal, both in geographies and in activities. I think you can find it in the church, and in, in the world of war, in the world of business, in the world of culture, in the world of sports, in the world of art, of science, uh, wherever you look, where there is there are humans interacting and power is a currency, you will find that the trends uh, that I describe in the book obtain. Fascinating. OK, let's open it up to questions. If you have a question, uh, please remember to identify yourself. Uh, and if, if uh, pertainable, your affiliation. Also, please phrase your comments in the form of a question. We do want to fit in as many questions as possible. Uh, the lady uh, with the mic. Thank you. Anne Lalina, the Lalina Group. Would you please elaborate on your earlier statement, ISIL Daesh is denying armed forces options? It seems to me that it's armed forces that are choosing not to do certain things, but I'd really like your elaboration. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And you gave the answer. Armed forces that decide not to do certain things. Why? Because they're constrained. If you talk to any, I, I had the privilege of spending several hours with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The chairman uh, invited me in to discuss the book. And I can talk about that because he then went on television and, uh, and, and said that we had this conversation. Uh, and there was nothing confidential about it. Uh, but what's very clear is that the, this was a very interesting meeting with me, for me, because these were the most powerful military officers in the world. They command the most weapons, technology, resources, money, you know. And they recognized and accepted that there were things that they could do and couldn't do. And, by, and it sounds like a, a, a play with words, but there are options they, they could do. They have the technology, they have the power, they have, but there are the constraints, the domestic constraints in politics, the, the international, there are new international standards. Uh, you know, the armed forces in the Second World War could do things uh, like, you know, nuke a city uh, that now uh, will be much harder, much more limited. So. There are important constraints uh, in what are, are the armed forces of democracies uh, can do. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the armed forces of the United States, for example, I don't think could ever have done what the Russian armed forces did in Chechnya and in Grozny. Uh, and if you look at the story about that, or, or imagine the United States, imagine that there is a war in, with Mexico. And a, an NGO invades Mexico, or takes a chunk of Mexico, an NGO. That is, uh, these are called the Mexican Patriots, but in fact are members of the armed forces of the United States. That is what Russia did in Ukraine. They said, uh, the little green man, that if they said they were just activists, they were patriots, they were, you know, Russian-speaking nat Ukrainian nationalists that essentially took over Crimea and are now destabilizing Eastern Ukraine. Well, Russia can do that. Do you imagine how long would it be take uh, uh, for reporters uh, if the United States did that, if the United States invaded another country by using its armed forces disguised uh, as a group of activists 
it would take 30 seconds for her to, to be on, on, on television and explaining what, what, what was going on. So all I'm saying is, yes, uh, uh, th there are important new constraints uh, on how uh, war is waged these days, especially by democracies. Okay. Um, I'm just back from a, a very interesting conference at the CSIS on the Estonia model on e-governance. And as you know, Estonia has been the first uh, country in Europe to go completely digital in terms of parliament. Do you think that the Estonian model could be a good contribution to uh, fighting corruption that we are facing, uh, at least in Europe? Absolutely, absolutely. And that belongs to a long list of innovations. When I say that we are uh, at, the, at, the, at the verge of, of, of seeing a lot of examples of uh, using digital tools, but also uh, other institutional arrangements, uh, that will change the way we govern ourselves in a variety of ways, not only fighting corruption, but in how decisions are made, how we all participate. I believe that what's happening in Estonia is interesting uh, and can be can yield very interesting results. Uh, I believe that a lot is happening in cities, for example. I believe that a lot of uh, political innovations are going to come from, from cities uh, and the way cities are organizing uh, themselves. Can we bring the microphone up to the front here? Gentleman has a question. Okay, why don't, why don't we, yeah, thank you very much. He's been waiting a minute. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, for an excellent <clears throat> discourse in your lecture as well as your book, The End of Power, and your excellent question that you asked. Uh, I believe if I write a, a book now, I'm going to title it Beginning of Power in the Digital Age. Because this, as you know, those of us who remember during Vietnam, the information and the enemies were being tracked by cameras in the neck of pigeons on the other side of the mountains. We don't need that anymore because we have new technology that can, through satellite system, that can track every movement of everything in a matter of seconds. The power, as you very well mentioned, in the old age was totally different, and it is now changed into a different way. Elections are won, um, elections are lost uh, in the digital age by the power of texting, for example, that gives me the example of the Philippines. The Iron Man of the Philippines, President Estrada, lost that because the Filipino public or people at the time, through texting, really uh, uh, created a, in, an atmosphere where he had to resign. Power of uh, electronics. Sir, can I ask you, uh, is there a question? If we can get to the questions, sure. so we can fit in uh, people. I, I just meant to say that the the new digital age provides us challenges, as you very well mentioned, but it gives us also an opportunity that we need to utilize. Uh, you, you brought in the NGOs. The N, one of the NGOs during the just a few days ago, during the G7 summit, beamed by digital way on the highest mountain of Germany. Sir, I'm so sorry. Uh, I think we're going to have to move on unless there is a question at the end of. Sure. The question is really uh, how do we deal in the new digital age those challenges that are presented? And how can continue to keep the power even in the new digital age? Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for, for your comments. The, 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 one of the realities that we all know is that the, what you call the digital age surprises us every day. There's something new, unexpected, different, transformational, disruptive that just pops up that, that creates a new reality. Uh, a lot of them, as you said, are welcome and, and wonderful, and others are uh, not that much. Uh, I think um, this is a, the, the right place to, to mention an Italian thinker Antonio Gramsci, uh, who, uh, did, uh, you know, he was writing um, a long time ago, but he said uh, a phrase that said, uh, the old is dying, uh, the new is being, is yet to be born, 
uh, in this chiaroscuro, in this uh, transition, monsters are bred. Uh, and then uh, at that time, of course, fascism was the monster that appears. Uh, and I don't, I'm not predicting that something as horrible as fascism will emerge. But I am predicting that, and it's a silly prediction, in fact, that, you know, we will continue to be surprised by uh, the disruptive transformational events. And in many ways, it's going to be wonderful. And in some uh, horrible ways, he's going to be a big threat. Uh, and the gentleman in the in the jacket. Uh, yes, um, Jeff Hahn. I'm from RCR Wireless. I just had a question in regards to, uh, you know, uh, the decay of power and democratization. Do you feel that attempts at greater democratization have, in fact, accelerated the decay of power? Uh, you brought up lower interest of young people in government, but also there's the trend in lower voter turnout, and I'll. Give you an example my home state texas it's most recent uh, it's it's a very democratic state in that all chief executive positions in the government are directly elected and the legislature uh every level exact uh, even judges are directly elected and yet voter turnout has shrunk to almost 28 percent and you have a uh, very hardcore ideological group mobilized through digital media which is consistently winning primaries and elections which is in turn disenchanting the larger majority. So has this created kind of a tyranny of the minority through attempts at greater democratization? We always have had in democracies a tyranny of minorities. We always have seen examples around the world of groups that do not represent uh, the large, uh, you know, the largest uh, segment of the population, but they acquire the power because they are more intensively participating. They are more active. They, you know, they are more dedicated. They're more the ten percent that are really devoting their life uh, uh, to their cause, and the ninety percent that they just are normal citizens going about their lives. And so that that has always been the case. And it may be that the, the, the examples of Texas that you cite is just one more example of that in uh, turbocharged by digital technology. But at the same time, and this is the good news of uh, uh, digital technology, that also opens the, the door for alternative groups to also undertake, uh, uh, you know, and, and initiate, uh, adopt the digital world in order to compensate for that. So. Again, I think we are in transitions uh, where a lot of uh, bad things and, and new things and good things coexist. And uh, we don't know yet the, the final outcome of those things. We have a gentleman over here who'd like to ask a question. Yes. My name is Dean Reed. I'm the, uh, the Reed Company's International Public Policy Consultancy. My question is, uh, goes back to your remarks on the uh, uh, hackers from China and the, the rise. Uh, can you extend that and how that applies to the rise of China and to uh, China's militancy in places such as the uh, South China Sea and relate that to your remarks about your meeting with Joint Chief of Staff and the constraints on our military? Uh, there are several facts that are indisputable about China. China is a, an economic miracle. They have grown immensely. They have lifted uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They are very successful economically. They are, uh, I, they, depending on which institutions uh, statistics you believe, they have either surpassed in GDP uh, their the United States or they are about to surpass the United States. So. And, and, and the other obvious fact is that you cannot be a great economic power and not have that stoke your geopolitical appetites. You know, go, they go together. Uh, and after having said all that, uh, in the book, I, I, I suggest that we should uh, not use the elevator approach to geopolitics. The elevator approach to geopolitics is obsessed with who's up and who's down. And, and try to, you know, and I, I argue for a, uh, what I think is a more interesting uh, way at, at looking the thing, and they say, take a look at what's happening in the elevator, inside the elevator, instead of, uh, and you know, of course, who's up and who's down is interesting. But if you take a look at what's happening inside the elevator, in the case of China, you, the first thing you discover is that, yes, it may have the largest GDP of the world, but on the GDP per capita, Peru has a larger, is, is higher than, than China. Uh, so think about that. Uh, if you drive a few hours, not even a few hours from the cities that everyone visits, you know, if you leave the coastal, um, you know, 
globalized uh, uh, part of China with Shanghai, Beijing, and, and everything, Shenzhen, and everything in the middle, um, you drive just a few hours and you are in medieval China. Uh, and so this is a very poor country that has internal challenges uh, that, uh, you know, ha the three revolutions are uh, uh, present in China with a vengeance. Uh, the, just think about what they are. More mobility, mentality. Think about what's going on in China with each of the three, and you will see that it's a country that, yes, by definition, because of its economic success, it will have uh, larger appetites uh, to participate in the world in, in, in very important ways. Uh, and But at the same time, it will have important domestic constraints. And of course, the danger there always is how domestic uh, upheavals uh, create incentives to create international distractions. And that may be a challenge always. The gentleman in the yellow. Thank you, Josh Rogan, uh, reporter with Bloomberg View. Um, I'd like you to uh, ask you to apply your frame to what many around the world see as the decay of American power, uh, American America as a superpower. On the one hand, it seems that the Obama administration is both aware and comfortable with the diffusion of power away from an, uh, an American central world order. At the same time, the criticism has been that the uh, current administration doesn't, hasn't managed that transition uh, competently or, with, uh, or strategically. And I'm wondering if you, A, you agree with that, and B, how would you grade the administration on reacting to all of these dynamics that you lay out? Um, I, I just published, uh, I write a column that uh, is published everywhere, but in the United States and published in the Atlantic. And it's uh, titled the uh, U.S. Self-Inflicted Wounds. And the column essentially gives very concrete examples of decisions made in Washington by United States politicians uh, that undermine the United States standing in the, in the world. So the point of the column is don't look, you, you, you wanna look at threats to United States power in the world, don't look at Beijing, look at Washington and watch what Washington is doing to the United States, to the American standing in the world. And I give a bunch of examples that illustrate that. Uh, and, and by Washington, you mentioned, so how do you grade the administration on this decisions that really undermine, well, I'm sure that there is a lot to criticize uh, the Obama administration for being late, uh, for not being sufficiently uh, effective in managing the politics. So the, the list is, is long, and uh, you, Josh, write about it very eloquently and uh, in a highly reported way that it's very interesting. But uh, if you ask me who is more uh, at fault of this, I would look at the US Congress rather than the, the, the executive. Just look at some of the decisions and some of the lack of decisions that the U.S. Congress uh, has had on, on, on that aspect in the world. So uh, in many ways, I would say that the Obama administration has been the victim of a Congress that is gridlocked, paralyzed, uh, highly ideologized, non-pragmatic, uh, and uh, short-term, uh, dominated by short-term thinking. Uh, the Obama administration has problems and deficits and limits and defects, of course, of course. Um, is that uh, uh, helped by the U.S. Congress? Yes, of course. So that, that's one point. Then the second point is the America standing in the world. Yeah, America's decline. In international politics, what matters is not your power. Is What matters is relative power. So yes, uh, the United States now may, may be more constrained and undermined from inside and a lot of self-inflicting inflicted wounds. But think about the rivals. And, and so the power, the, uh, according to the book, everyone uh, has a uh, decline uh, in its power. So the United States may power and standing in the world may be more constrained, but if I, what I say in the book is correct, everyone else is. So whenever you think of geopolitics, don't think about absolute power compared to the past. Uh, think about relative power compared to the present and what's happening to your rivals. Okay. Uh, I believe there's a lady. There we go. Um, Selma Kinesi from K Street Magazine. I was wondering, how did you become interested in... If you could hold the mic a little closer. Oh, sure. 
Um, and someone, can you see from case? Cannot hear. Uh, Selma, can you see from K Street Magazine? I was wondering, how did you become interested in an analyzing democracies and authoritarian uh, regimes? Um, did it have anything to do with where you were born? The last part was? Did it have anything to do with where you were born? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it obviously had, uh, we all write about uh, things uh, on which we have experience. And, uh, I, I, I write about this in the, in, in, in the, in the introduction and, to the book. Um, just for the audience's uh, understanding, you were born in Venezuela, is that? No, I, I was born in Libya. Uh, but I left uh, Libya when I was uh, three years old and never been back. So I, I am a Venezuelan. I am. Uh, I grew up and I am essentially a Venezuelan. Uh, uh, and uh, that was my formative experience. And uh, in the book, I write about that. I don't want to expand on it here. But essentially, it started when I was in government. Uh, I was uh, perceived to be a very powerful economic minister that could get things done. And people would come and visit me in my very, very large office, and they would ask me to do things that I felt were right, uh, they were sensible, intelligent, things that the country needed done. And I would just say, don't worry, we'll get it done. And then I would discover that I didn't have uh, the, the budget, I didn't have the people, I didn't have the institutional capacities, I had an opposition that wouldn't let me do anything. And I couldn't do it, even though I thought it was necessary and desirable. And I chalked it down to the fact that I was not a politician. I had arrived there uh, essentially because I was a technocrat. Uh, uh, and so I was 36 years old. I was young, inexperienced, and not political. And so I thought, well, it's just my incompetence. But then I started talking to my colleagues in the cabinet, who also were, uh, you know, were older than I and far more experienced in politics. And I discovered that they too felt that the perceived power uh, was much bigger than what they actually can get done, could get done. And then I decided that that had to do with Venezuela that had a, a very incompetent uh, uh, and very fragile in public sector. From being a minister, I came to Washington to the board of the World Bank. And that gave me the opportunity to talk to uh, people in power and ministers, cabinet members from around the world, from Africa and Eurasia, Asia, Latin America. And we will tell them, as you would do at the World Bank, you should reform this and do that, one, two, three, and you will give them a long list of uh, things they, need, they needed to get done that were obvious and rational and natural and desirable and, and tested. And they would look at you, and it, I saw in their eyes that they were in the position in which I had been uh, a while ago. They would say, yeah, sure, easy for you to say, go do it. Uh, and there I, I, it, I had the hunch that these limits on what the powerful uh, can do was a more universal thing. And as, then I became the editor of Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, and I did that for 14 years. And that also gave me a, a very privileged, very unique perch from which to trace what was happening to power on a global basis. Um, we have a question from at Erica Rogers. Uh, thank you for watching and for submitting your question. Uh, with the decline of youth's interest in politics, what do you recommend we do to activate young people to uh, improve and get involved? Young people are actively involved. Young people are more energized, participatory, they're participating, they're active, they are worried, they are greener than ever. This, this generation is far more greener, far more active and committed to, kind, to matters of uh, preserving the environment and global change and all that. So our problem is not that the, that the youth are not active and are not engaged. They are just not engaged in politics as usual. They are not engaged in political parties, in the traditional political parties. So what needs to happen is that new avenues, new channels, new institutions, new innovations in politics can take the energy of these people uh, and, and, and channel it towards uh, uh, governing. Right. OK, 
I think we have time for two more questions, and we have the gentleman over here with the mic. Franco Impala from the Italian Embassy. Uh, since you are so familiar with Italian thinkers, what <laughs> do you think uh, Machiavelli would advise to modern leaders in order to keep their power? <laughs> that's a great, that's a great uh, uh, question. Um, I don't know. I don't know in which way Machiavelli would have to adjust uh, his in original intuitions and, and recommendations to the world of the end of power. Uh, what I think it would be a modern, a modern day Machiavelli would tell uh, the prince uh, not to believe in its power uh, because that leads to mistakes. If you believe that your power is there forever, permanent, uh, uh, you know, you are sure to be disappointed and you are sure to make mistakes. If you think about Italy and uh, how power has become easier to acquire, more difficult to use and easier to lose, think about Cinque Stelle and Beppe Grillo. <laughs> if we had this conversation uh, two years ago, the, and we will think who is the most important transformational, game-changing uh, person in Italy, is Beppe Grillo. I assume everybody knows this is a, a, an, a, an Italian started as a comedian and then launched his uh, political party called Five Stars, Cinque Stelle, and became quite a force in Italy. So easy to acquire. And then he won, uh, he couldn't win, but his party got a bunch of uh, elections. You know, he won a lot of elections. He had uh, people in parliament, he had power. And then that using power became obviously hard for them. And now I think everybody would agree that Cinque Stelle today uh, is still a powerful entity in Italy, but it's not the revolutionary, transformational, uh, disruptive uh, power that it was just a few years ago. Uh, Sarah Hager, Georgetown University. I just have a question about your title and your focus on the uh, decline of power and you describe very well the decline of uh, mega powers shifting to other forms and models of power. Um, how do you, rather than have this sense of negativity about power, now that we have a new models reflecting the millennium, how do you propose we focus on this new style, new models, new patterns of uh, uh, power? That's a great question, and thank you, because uh, the book is actually very optimistic. I am, uh, you, you say that there is a negative connotation to, 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 to and I didn't mean uh, that. And in the book, I'm very explicit that uh, we are coming from a decade of uh, very, very welcome changes. And I also argue that the trends that I describe in the end of power, uh, we should be applauding and celebrating. This is a world uh, where uh, exclusion is more difficult. This is a world that, that where tyrants and dictators have to feel more insecure. Uh, this is a world where monopolists uh, have uh, more challenges and they can be challenged by a bunch of kids working out of a garage and inventing a technology that undermines the monopoly power. This is um, a, a world in which people can take to the streets and popular tyrants. Uh, this is a world in which uh, people, including women, that have historically been discriminated and, and, and excluded, um, have a better chance. I'm not suggesting that we are there and that now we live in a Pollyannish uh, situation where men and women are uh, at parity, but surely uh, women uh, have made progress uh, in some places and now have a shot. And a lot of marginalized, excluded, discriminated against groups now have a shot. I'm not suggesting that they uh, have power, but they have more of a shot of getting it. And again, and as I said before, uh, just go to the web and look at, uh, pick any aspect of the human experience, nutrition, education, anything, uh, life expectancy, pick anything and, and see what was that number. Uh, just 10 or 15 years ago, and look at what is the number today. Even with the great recession and economic crashes and all that, uh, today the world is better than it has ever been. Uh, and, uh, and I think one needs to celebrate that, and I believe that part of that is related to the trends that I discussed in the book. Okay, sir. 
Uh, Ralph Winnie with the Eurasian Business Coalition. I was recently uh, uh, on a U.S. delegation that went to Cuba. And what I found very fascinating there was while only about 6% of the people have access to the internet, they have cell phones, they have iPods, iPhones. And I, when you look at their technology, they have the same sort of apps that we have here, um, equivalent of a Google map or equivalent of a Lyft, or they know where to go to find restaurants or to get, or to get transportation. They just don't have access to the internet. They have, um, and the government is is starting to let them travel to the outside world, to the United States. Where do you see this power of the digital age taking uh, the Cuban people, and how do you see tensions with the government trying to continue to keep them closed off from from the U.S. and other other countries? And how how do you see that evolving? Uh, I see, you know, I, I don't think that the main driver of uh, changing Cuba is the digital revolution. I think that there are other forces at work. Uh, I, I think that the Castro brothers and their family and their enterprises are now building a succession and a structure that will ensure that the members of the elite and the oligarchy that has run Cuba for 60 years are protected. Um, I welcome uh, the lifting of the embargo. I think the embargo meant make, made no sense and just served to give uh, uh, the Castro brothers an excuse to justify the bankruptcy of their ideas and the revolution. Uh, and it didn't do anything uh, for the Cuban people. So I welcome the lifting of the embargo. I welcome their rapprochement between the Washington and Havana. I hope that moves quickly and fast and. Uh, but um, it's going to be disappointing. I think um, the Castro brothers uh, and Raul Castro are going to essentially try to sustain uh, their model for a long time, while at the same time dealing with this opportunity and try to navigate to the other side, uh, protecting uh, the members of the elite. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, and they are perfectly aware uh, that uh, exchanges with the world, and especially uh, digital exchanges, are a threat. They know that. And so they will act accordingly. Okay, I know we're pushing up on the uh, time limit here, but um, the lady in the back, I believe, will take the last question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Naim. Um, you said that the Russian government keep continue to provide uh, no digital diplomacy, and we all know that uh, this government continue abusing international law and uh, provide uh, international terrorism worldwide. We remember, uh, like you mentioned, um, uh, Abkhazia, Russian, Russian, Russian government today, uh, Abkhazia, we remember in Georgia, uh, Moldova, uh, Ukraine today, the war still exists in the East and the uh, occupation of Crimea more than one year, this not digital diplomacy exists. Do you think that the uh, strategy that international community used, uh, particularly United States, is effective? And uh, do you think these sanctions are enough to stop this violence? Thank you. I. Well, first, uh, we need to recognize, uh, talk about self-inflicted wounds. Uh, Vladimir Putin hated and hates NATO. And then he did things that uh, re-energized and gave a second uh, uh, win to NATO. NATO was uh, an, an organization without a mission, without a, enough budgets, with all kinds of complications. And thanks to Vladimir Putin's uh, behavior, NATO now is resurgent, may not be the the organization that we all want it to be, but it surely is now, uh, you know, the owners of NATO, the members of NATO are paying more attention to NATO as a solution and as a possibility that was the case before Putin grabbed uh, Crimea. So that's the first thing. The second self-inflicted wound is that he unified Europe. Uh, Putin was able to create a, a consensus that it was uh, unimaginable. Uh, just before that. And so you have all kinds of countries, including countries that are highly dependent on Russia, on Russian gas, and, and, and Italy is a good example, uh, that are willing to go ahead and, and impose sanctions, and sanctions that are biting, uh, having consequences. 
in, in Russia that combined with the lower prices of oil. And remember, Russia is now a petrostate. Russia is, uh, has all the characteristics of a petrostate. And well, uh, together with lower oil prices and sanctions, Russia's economy is hurting. Now, uh, that's not a democracy. So Putin can, be, through his control of the media and his control of the security agencies and its repressive mechanisms and everything else, he can last uh, quite a long time, uh, despite the suffering of the Russian people as a result of sanctions and a bad economy and international isolationism, capital flight, uh, lack of investment and everything else that we know. Well, thank you all for coming out today. This has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you, very thank much. you so much. Thank you.